if you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty, if you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength, if you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ, if you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Welcome to Considering Catholicism. I'm Greg Smith, your guide to the faith, life, and civilization that is historic Catholic Christianity. Well, it's that time of the year again. We're decorating our homes, shopping for gifts, having office parties, and making plans to get together with our loved ones to celebrate Christmas. But, just as sure as all of those traditions, it's time for the annual myths about how and why the Catholic Church celebrates Christmas. You'll see articles and videos online and maybe even hear a sermon or a lecture about how the Catholic Church was inspired or corrupted by ancient pagan religions and invented Christmas traditions by borrowing from ancient pagan festivals. So, it's time to swat down this nonsense and tell the truth about why and how the Catholic Church celebrates the Feast of the Nativity of Christ on December 25. And if you have any thoughts, questions, or suggestions, send me an email, greg at consideringcatholicism.com. So, Corey, every year as Christmas rolls around, Mm -hmm. we start playing the Christmas songs earlier and earlier and earlier. It used to be after Thanksgiving, and then now, like, the stores have started playing the Christmas carols, like, in September or something This is a pet peeve of mine. We have a ban on it until Christmas Eve in our household. Oh, (laughs) yeah. And it becomes more and more uh, sort of um, secularized. Like, I I was looking for a radio, so I have satellite radio in my car, and I was going through trying to find, well, if I'm going to listen to Christmas songs, where's the Christmas Mm -hmm. station? But all of the stations, you know, like the holiday, they're no longer Christmas stations, they're holiday stations. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely no Christian songs on them. It's all like, you know, Santa baby and, you know, come home for the holidays. And it's like, which pop singer or country singer or rap artist is going to do their version of, you know, Santa Claus is coming to town or something. And it, it becomes tiresome. But one of the things that, and that inevitably happens around this time of the year mm-hmm. is people start publishing articles and you're going to start seeing them that cr- the origins of Christmas are really pagan. Mm. And I've been seeing these articles my whole adult life. Oh yeah. And it's only proliferated with the internet. Right. And so every year, and they really come from two directions. So you'll have kind of the mainstream secularist media that loves to poke, to to publish these things every year. And you'll inevitably see them, you know, on TV or on the internet or whatever. Uh, And they love to do it because I think they like poking Christianity in the eye a little bit. Sure. Sure. Oh, you know, Christianity just adopted a bunch of this warmed over paganism you know, and all this, but you also get it from the fundamentalist Protestants who their argument is that the Catholic church, the evil Catholic church, somewhere in the dawns and mists of time, uh, is basically just, uh, adopted a bunch of paganism. You hear this about the saints, you hear this about Mary, you hear this about, and you hear it about Christmas Mm -hmm. that somewhere there was all these ancient pagan festivals and practices and the church just kind of glommed onto them. And, and barely Christianized them. And so therefore, you know, uh, we shouldn't celebrate, you know, these things or we should be suspicious of the Catholic Church and Christmas and, you know, all of that. And to all of that, I say, bah hum. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so this is, this is considering Catholicism's response to that. So uh, why don't we just kind of talk a little bit about some of these myths? Sure, you, sure. You, you want to talk about the whole idea of w- w- where Christmas came from in terms of uh, being a pagan holiday or Christian holiday? Yeah. So, so one of the fundamental claims that you hear um, in these kinds of arguments is that there were other pagan holidays around at the you know, the, the early centuries of what we now call, you know, AD. 
um, that there was uh, uh, Saturnalia, that there was the cult of uh, Sol Invictus, the unconquerable sun, um, that there were of other holidays associated with these with these Scandinavians had Yule, right? Sure, um, whichever pagan group you're, you're talking about, Roman world or or sort of what they would have called barbarians. And so the argument goes that the Christians encountered pagans celebrating these these holidays um, in the dead of winter in December. And in order to try and win people over, essentially, um, they said, all right, well, we'll take the holiday and we'll change the name and we'll put some baby Jesus stuff on it. And now it's ours. Right. That's so the basic claim. That's a basic claim, right? So that they, they couldn't wean the people or truly convert the people. The people were at best half converted pagans. And so, yeah, to your, to your thing, they just slapped a, a Jesus sticker on it. And, and that's the origin of the thing being, you know, a barely concealed pagan holiday. Let's respond to <laughs> yes. this, okay? Um, I know we were talking before we started the recorder here um, about this, and there's probably five or six different ways to sort of tackle this argument. Do you, you want to take a stab at, at, at one of those? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, the most important thing is there really isn't evidence for these claims, um, that uh, the historical timeline doesn't make sense. Um, the the history of how the whole liturgical calendar came about, it, it was a historical process and, you know, there wasn't a, a fixed feast of the nativity on December 25th, you know, in AD 33, when Jesus ascended into heaven, it took time and there were different parts of the Christian world that celebrated the nativity on different dates, especially in the East. It was celebrated on January 6th. You'll, you'll still see Orthodox um, emphasizing that holiday more. But it, it, it's just the truth that early in, you know, the, the first two, three, four hundred years of Christianity, you have sort of, um, it, it, it's starting to congeal around the end of December that this is when we celebrate the nativity. And we don't have evidence for those pagan festivals either preceding that or influencing that or the, the church co-opting it. Uh, we, we, we have evidence of the church in its process of, of putting together the, the liturgy of developing this feast, but it, it's just not the case that we, we see th- the process of, you know, wholesale adoption of pagan practices. It, so so let's, let's just take like the Christmas fork. Is there such a thing, like the thing that you stab the roast beast with, whatever? Oh, I, I, yeah. I don't so I'm going to take the Christmas fork and stick it through this the heart of this idiocy <laughs> that's a horrible metaphor but ah, well anyway so first of all okay let's just take take them one by one right mm-hmm. so there was this roman holiday called saturnalia mm-hmm. or saturnalia and it was like a two or three day sort of thing where people you know drank a lot and which is what a roman holiday kind of, is like yeah, yeah right <laughs> kind of a stupid drunken <laughs> it's kind of what a modern american yeah, holiday yeah is like. three day kind of drunken party then uh, eating and drinking and all that sort of thing and it was, it was in mid-December. Uh, it was always like in the dead of winter. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but you know, that's not unusual. Almost everybody in the world and every culture, especially in agrarian, in agrarian cultures, had a midwinter holiday. Mm-hmm. And in fact, one of the arguments is wherever you went, I mean, the pagans had holidays all the time. Mm-hmm. Like every month of the year was some big holiday. So wherever you stuck Christmas, it was going to be like close to some Roman holiday. But there was a holiday called Saturnalia. It wasn't the 25th of December. It was closer to the uh, solstice. And it was actually uh, like in the middle of December, like how the Romans sort of ca- counted holidays from the, the Calends and the Ides mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff. But in any case, there was a Roman holiday called Saturnalia. It had almost no relationship. And in the early church, all of the early church fathers, all of their sermons, everything else, instead of saying to the Christians, hey, you know, let's embrace Saturnalia and, you know, whatever. Almost all of the early uh, homilies, sermons, writings were rejecting the Roman holiday of Saturnalia. They told Christians not to participate in them and they rejected it. So it wasn't like they said, hey, let's glom onto this thing. They were all rejecting it. Um, The fact that Christmas eventually occurred in the same month, well, okay, right? Again, which month, wherever you put it in the calendar is going to be close to some. So Saturnalia, let's leave that out. The, the second one, I just want to mention it because if people are going to read these articles yeah, and hear yeah. about this, they're going to have a fundamentalist pastor who like does this in a sermon. 
The second one that they point to, as you said, is is a, a Roman holiday called Saul Invictus, the the mm-hmm. invincible sun, right? But the weird thing about that is the earliest possible reference to Saul Invictus being celebrated by the Romans is by the Roman emperor Aurelian in the year 354. That's 354 years after. And coincidentally, without getting too deep into this, right? The emperor Constantine, who brought Christianity to uh, uh, to Legal. the Roman, yeah, yeah. legalized it and, and endorsed it. It's after Constantine, so Aurelian was actually trying to reestablish a pagan holiday to compete with Christmas. Mm-hmm. It, the order, the, the order is backwards. Instead of the Christians glomming onto Saul Invictus, the emperor Aurelian came along and went, "Like everybody's become Christians now, and they're all celebrating Christmas. I'm going to invent." A holiday to compete with it, a mm-hmm. pagan holiday. So that went backwards. Yeah. Well, and and Saturnalia probably had more people for a longer period of time celebrating it too. I mean, Sol Invictus was kind of like a, a minor cult. I mean, yeah, it, it was a, it was a small thing, and it was very late. And it it was wasn't after, like everybody in in the Roman Empire was well, celebrating. Well, this. we we do have church fathers that allude to the feast of the Nativity, Christmas, mm-hmm. being celebrated at the end of December as early as 200 AD. So the Saul Invictus thing is like 150 years later. Um, and so, so that's, and then the Yule thing it was like this Viking holiday where they celebrated this goddess named Yule or something like that. But the church didn't encounter them for hundreds of more years after that. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like, again, the timeline gets really goofy here. By the time the church in, encountered the holiday of Yule, that some Vikings had, it was another several centuries later. So Christmas, the Feast of the Nativity being near the end of December, the, around the 1st of January, was well established by, you know, the, the early 3rd century, the early 200s. Um, and we'll get into the dating of the 25th mm-hmm. specifically. But I just wanted to say, like, these three theories about Saturnalia, Saul Invictus, and the Yule thing are just factually historically wrong well it, it's it's a case of taking some kind of correlation or similarity and, and implying that there's a causation that, that the evidence doesn't really support yes they're in the middle of the winter um they're a festival that's about it yeah you know so that's that now, let's dial in on this thing about December 25, because mm-hmm. that's actually interesting why uh, Christmas is celebrated on December 25. And as you said, in the East, it was celebrated on January 6, but December 25, and I want to make an important distinction here. The Catholic Church celebrates the Nativity on December 25. It does not teach that the nativity actually occurred on December 25. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's not literally the calendar birthday of Jesus. Um, we, we could, and people have made arguments that they can figure out when that was. We don't know with absolute certainty. And also the calendar's changed like two or three times since then. Right, how the dates are calculated. And, and, but, but I do want to say a couple things about that. First of all, one people say, well, why don't we know what the exact date of the nativity was? And I thought this was pretty interesting. I was doing some reading on this recently. Um, So for us, birthdays are a thing, Mm -hmm. right? When's your birthday? What's your birthday? How do you celebrate your birthday? That's not necessarily true in all cultures. And in the early Roman period, people didn't necessarily celebrate birthdays. Well, and the Jews particularly did not. And of course, Christianity arises out of Judaism. The, The first Christians were Jews. Um, like if you look in the scriptures, like the birthdays that are described are like Herod and the Pharaoh. Like right. this wasn't something that was a part of wholesome Jewish culture. <laughs> I read, uh, I read that there were, uh, whether it was missionaries or I don't know, sociologists or something, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, would go to the Middle East and they would ask people, you know, when they were born and they, they don't know. So in, in other words, uh, there were significant dates in your life, your mm-hmm. marriage, uh, the day people die, people, things like that. But the specific, people didn't necessarily sell it the specific day that you were born, or you might know the approximate. But, but so birthday, we're fixated on birthdays. And the reason I bring this up is that people will say, well, 
didn't the apostles record the date of Jesus' birthday? And why does, doesn't there's a historical record? And, and it just, it wasn't a thing. Well, think of the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. He describes it in terms of, you know, who was the emperor and who was the governor right. of, of Syria at the time. And dating just wasn't precise. They didn't have the tools or, or they didn't care about it the way that we do. Our, our right. lives in the modern world are run by the clock and by the calendar. Right. Um, that's just not how it was back then. Well, yeah. And as you say, there, there were different calendar systems. So the ways that the Romans counted days of the month was different than the way that the Greeks counted the days of the month, which was different than the way that the Jews counted days of the month, which is different than the ways the Egyptians counted days of the month. So therefore to say in the ancient Roman empire, what is your birthday is a complicated question. But there's a lot of reasons to believe that uh, Jesus was born in the winter. And we don't have to get into all of those, but there's, there's biblical reasons, historical reasons to mm-hmm. believe that he was born during the winter. And the early church, w- what I've read is that there are, were arguments anywhere from late November to early January. There are historical reasons, biblical reasons to sort of suggest that his birth probably occurred in those winter months. Mm-hmm. Now, Then the church had to fix a specific date. And as you say, there were reasons why the churches in the East tended to pick January 6th as the feast day. In other words, the day on the liturgical calendar that we would celebrate it. Not necessarily asserting that that's the exact day he was born, but knowing that he was born sometime in that window, say six, eight week window between near the end of November Mm -hmm. and early Mm -hmm. January and saying, well, we're going to pick a particular date to make that the, the feast day or the memorial day where we have that celebration. Right, right. So December 25, and I think this goes back to the mythology, because one of the myths is that Christmas, the pagan roots of Christmas, is it's just a, uh, uh, it, it's associated with the winter solstice, right? So it's the shortest day of the year. And then like the sun returns, you've heard this kind of yeah, stuff, yeah. the sun returns. Well, that's part of the Sol Invictus Yeah, thing. the whole Sol yeah. Invictus thing. The, the, the thing is, is that, but December 25 is not the solstice. The solstice is December 22 right. or 21, depending on leap years and some things and, like that. And that was something that the ancients would have known pretty precisely. Oh, people knew, yeah. I guarantee you, all the way back to, you know, thousands of years before Jesus, you can go around the world and find calendars. I, I've been to Newgrange in Ireland in which like, you know, 3,500 years ago, 4,000 years ago, they were calculating the exact um, day of the winter solstice because right. I've been inside Newgrange on, and when they, the light shines down. And it's not that hard to do. People are like, you know, the, the, Az, I mean, the Aztecs did it and the, the you know, yeah. Inca did it. Not that hard. I mean, basically you go out there every day and you put a post in the ground <laughs> and you count the days that the sun rises close to the post and you put a post when it starts to go back the other way and then you build a marker. Mm-hmm. So people knew when the solstice was. And in fact, I think maybe the, the church deliberately didn't put it on the solstice because it didn't want to look like a solstice festival. So, and there's some other reasons it has to do with the 25th is exactly nine of December is exactly nine months from the annunciation March 25. Right, so, right. you know, the idea that uh, Gabriel announces the conception and then nine months later he's born. Although there's not necessary reason to think the conception actually, that was the Annunciation. Mm-hmm. So, but the church had to pick dates on the calendar to fix these things. And it fixes December 25. And it's not a warmed over pagan solstice thing. There are good reasons, as I said, historically to think that Jesus was probably born in the winter. Uh, and December 25, for a variety of reasons in the West, becomes the date that it gets fixed. and. I mean, we could, it, it, this is kind of interesting. You get into a whole lot of things about Roman calendars and this and that. The calends of January and eight days before the calends of January is December 25 mm. and blah, 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 blah. So anyway, the important point I want to take for the listeners is that all of this stuff that you're going to hear that Christmas is a warmed over pagan holiday and the date is some warmed over thing uh, related to winter solstice festivals. It's just, it's just not accurate. Right. And, and well, it, it, all kind of uh, obscures the point of it, which is that this is when the church celebrates the birth of Christ. It's not that the church is saying that this is literally, like that's not how liturgical celebrations have 
to work. It doesn't have to be the exact day. This is when the church celebrates it. And that's the that's what we're doing it. Well, while we're on this, I mean, mm-hmm. we can we can let's 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 do another myth, okay? Mm-hmm. Which is sure. the whole thing about Easter. Um, right? Okay, so mm-hmm. this is this I mean I I, I got to be I want to be I pray every day when I pray my res- rosary, you know, the the, the third uh, Hail Mary on the front beads there is to pray for charity. Uh, and so I try to be charitable. Um, and I try not to say things like that's dumb, but it's, there's this thing that's super dumb. And that is this argument that, that the Catholic church celebrates Easter because there was some kind of a Germanic or English goddess named Ooster. Mm. And so we invented Easter as some kind of a weird, um, pickup or glomming on to some kind of early British thing about some Danish thing about some goddess named Ooster. Have you heard this? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's just, I'm sorry, dear listeners, but it's just so dumb and it's so dumb for a whole lot of reasons. So, and here's the biggest one is it, it, it's tied into this argument that the word Easter sounds like Ooster or right which is super dumb because the church didn't call it Easter. That's what we call it in English. It was called Pascha. Right. And, and we're the only language that calls it Easter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was actually uh, Pesco or Pascha or Pascha. Right. Which is after the Passover. Which is, right, yeah. which is the Jewish word for the Passover. And that does have a very specific date. So while the date of Christmas is to some degree arbitrarily set as December 25, the date of Easter is specifically linked in a complex system to the Jewish. Right? But, so there's a whole scheme. It's not the same as the mm-hmm. Passover, but it is related to the... Well, and there were all the conflicts about the dating of Easter. We don't have to get into right, that. We don't have to get that. But, but what I'm saying is the, the uh, Jewish Passover is a lunar dating system. It's mm-hmm. in a certain month right? Related to lunar cycles. Right. And so it's not an arbitrary date. Like the Jews just didn't pick this date. It's specifically a certain date. And it's in the Old Testament. It will be this date because it is on the lunar fixed calendar. Then, right, the, the church, uh, Jesus died on the Passover, right? Mm-hmm. We don't celebrate Easter uh, or we don't celebrate the crucifixion on the Passover, the Good Friday, and we don't celebrate Easter three days later. It's, but it's related to that month. It has to do with a complex system of how that was done, but it wasn't arbitrary. In other words, the church just didn't decide, hey, we'll stick it in April because we'll stick it in April. It has to do with its relationship with the lunar calendar of the Jews. So there actually was, is quite a reason, a set of reasons why Easter occurs when it does mm-hmm. and why Easter was not some kind of a pagan holiday. It was specifically related to the Jewish Passover. Jesus died on the Jewish Passover and he rose on the third day afterward. And it's called Pascha or Pascha, or whatever. And as you say, we're English is Americans, the only people that call it Easter. So we didn't invent Easter because there was a Scandinavian or Danish or British goddess named Booster. Okay. Mm-hmm. But Christmas is celebrated on December 25. The dating is somewhat arbitrary. There's good reasons why it was picked, but nobody's claiming. Right. Nobody was saying we have to have, we absolutely have to find the exact day or we can't celebrate this. Correct. Okay. Now, proceeding with our Christmas myths. Another yes. one, you want to talk about Christmas trees? Sure. I, I like Christmas trees. Um, so you'll, you'll hear uh, simply attacks on this as um, it is a pagan practice. It, it has to do with, you know, idol worship and that kind of thing. Uh, you'll also hear claims about its origin as coming from Germanic paganism. Um, and none of that corresponds really with, with reality or with the, with the historical facts. Um, you don't really have Christmas trees proper until you're getting closer to the, to the modern era. I mean, it, it is a, uh, originally a German practice. Um, but really late Middle Ages, early modern period, like really around the time of the Reformation, this becomes a, a bigger um, practice. And, and Which, by the way, is long after the sort of the Germanic pagan times. Right. It really is a, 
something that arose in the in the Middle Ages during the Christian era, mm-hmm. but it is a Germanic practice. The tree. Now, keep going. Yeah, but we'll talk about the greens in the house and all that. Right. Exactly. So, so the tree um, arises in the, the late Middle Ages or the early modern period. It's it's sort of a, a folk custom in the German lands. It gets exported to America and and to England and to other places. Um, and Christian meaning is is um, is attached to it um, in modern times. Like the Catholic Church has a blessing for Christmas trees. It's become a kind of sacramental, something that can remind us and help our devotion um, to Christ during during the Advent and Christmas seasons. Um, but there's no evidence historically that this was you know Christians um, or or anyone worshiping a tree or worshiping an idol in this way. There there were Germans German pagans who worshipped trees. And there was a saint yes. who chopped the <laughs> sacred tree down. You want yeah, to talk about that? Well, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and that is part of the Christmas tree legend. Um, this, this probably, the, the connection of St. Boniface to the Christmas tree is probably not factual, but we do have the story of St. Boniface going as a missionary from England to um, part of what is now Germany and encountering pagans there who are worshiping an oak associated with Thor, um, their god. And Boniface sort of does not a, a Doug, not a pr- pretty Douglas. No, fir, no, like big, not not what you would bring in your your home now. Um, and so Boniface decided that he wasn't going to have any of this nonsense. Um, and he whips out an axe and he chops this things down and he preaches a sermon to these pagans about Christ. That's um, so cool. By oh yeah, it's awesome. It's an awesome story. <laughs> <laughs> um, and converts many of them. And uh, there, there's a legend uh, that associates that story with the Christmas tree by saying then he, in, in, a, in a way, kind of like the legend with St. Patrick and the Shamrock, where he uses it as, as like an object lesson about the Trinity. There's a legend about St. Boniface then sort of turning to the evergreen tree and using it as an object lesson about, about God, about, um, you know, his eternity, his, his everlasting life, because, of course, the evergreen tree doesn't die and shed its leaves every year. Um, that it's got a sort of arrow shape that points to heaven. And so you have these folk stories and, and, and legends associating the Christmas tree with that. But it probably, the historical record doesn't seem to indicate that it's actually that early. Um, it's really more around the time of Martin Luther, um, whose name also sometimes in legend gets associated with the Christmas tree. He probably didn't personally institute it either. Um, but yeah, you, do, you don't have... Um, the the Christmas tree being bought brought into homes as a sort of concession to paganism. If anything, it's closer to the spirit of Saint Boniface, or is like we're gonna we're gonna take symbols that are explicitly pagan and either destroy them or make them about Christ. Well, I think I think one of the other things too is how certain things are essentially neutral mm-hmm. symbols. So consider, for example, something that's essentially like a neutral, like lighting a candle. Mm-hmm. Now, especially in the, obviously in most of the world history before there were electric lights, people light candles. And, and right? it's been religious. And it's and had it, religious it, significance it, all it over the world. It can have, yeah. right. I mean, all, every religion might, I mean, because lighting a candle is sort of a, a, a and in some sense, a neutral act that you can, you can attach meaning to, like you can light a candle for a particular reason, mm-hmm. but the idea of lighting candles isn't some like crazy original idea. And in the same way, bringing green things into your house in winter is not a crazy, like I, you, you didn't need some Vikings or something to suggest the idea to you. Mm-hmm. So actually there's a, one of the church fathers in the early 200s remarks that the Christians were more inclined to bring laurels and wreaths and fresh green things into their house in the winter than the pagans. were. Um, he was writing in, in the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, because again, it's winter, uh, it's cold out, it's dark, nothing's growing. Hey, let's bring some fresh flowers. Let's bring some laurels. Let's bring some green things in the house to, to sort of brighten things up and, to uh, you know, remind us that spring is coming and all that. Now that's a sort of a religiously neutral thing to do, mm-hmm. but people can then in a sense kind of attach some meaning to that the same way that I can light a candle just to light up the room, or I can light a candle and say, Hey, this candle has a special significance. So the fact that People were bringing green things into their house in the winter. It is it, not necessarily like it didn't occur to them until they met some pagans. Mm-hmm. It was a religiously neutral thing to do. But then the church says, well, okay, if you're going to bring some things into the house and you're going to bring them in at Christmas, I guess these things are here to, you know, uh, commemorate 
the Feast of the Nativity. Yeah, and this is just a, a part of, I think, the, the Catholic perspective on practices and in sort of the enactment of religion is, is that simply because something has been used in a bad way doesn't mean that it can't be used in a, in a good way um, right. if, it, if it's a neutral thing or, 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 or something that's good. I mean, even things like gestures, like different types of bowing or, or whatnot, yeah. people bowed to their pagan idols. We bow to to Christ and and to to icons right. that, that. And so we didn't get the idea of bow or mm-hmm. bowing. To your point, bowing yeah. isn't a pagan practice. That mm-hmm. right? It's bowing is a sort of a neutral thing to do. You can choose what to bow to. The pagans bowed to the Roman emperor. We bow to Jesus. Bowing isn't somehow a co opting of Christianity by Romans, right? And and, and I mean. If you want to try and strip all that out, what you end up is a religion that's no longer very human because you're not right. doing doing things that humans naturally do. It becomes a kind of disembodied religion. Um, some of the more extreme forms of of fundamentalism can can get this way, where it's like you know, no images, no gestures, no dancing, right. no music. Well, I think it goes to that term of imbuing meaning or attaching meaning to something that in and of itself is a neutral thing. Mm-hmm. So again, in the winter when it's cold and it's, and it's bleak to bring green things into your house to sort of cheer up your home, isn't it? So it's on, you don't even need to be religious to do that. Mm-hmm. But somewhere along the way, the church decided when it came to the Christmas tree that this act of bringing something into the house, that if, if Christians decided to do that and sort of attach that, meaning to that to Christmas or attach that to the celebration of Christmas, that doesn't make it a pagan thing. And it doesn't make Christmas a pagan celebration or that Christmas is somehow being co-opted by paganism. It just means that we're going to bring some green things to the house and we're going to say that these, this is a Christmas tree mm-hmm. as opposed to the secularist who brings in you know, potted plants because they like potted plants, right? Mm-hmm. And I think this is an important point that It goes to, like you say, this larger thing in Catholicism where the church has always allowed certain things to be imbued with meaning. Uh, Whether that's, as you say, a bowing or Christmas trees or processions or, Mm -hmm. and this is where a lot of the sacramentals come from, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? Just now, the Christmas tree is not a sacramental, but in a sense, if it, it, in a sense, it's not a formal sacramental by the church, right? Well, I don't know. I, I, there is, is a, it, there is an official blessing for there's Christmas a blessing, tree. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, just like you might bless something else. Well, yeah, but you yeah. can also get my dog blessed or right, my right. Harley Davidson so blessed. So I suppose more properly, so you would say the blessing is the sacramental, but. Right. It's not, it, right. It's not a recognized sacramental like holy water or something mm-hmm. like that. Nevertheless, if I decide to bring a Christmas tree into the house because I'm a Christian, and it reminds me of Christmas and the birth of our Savior. And every time I look at it, it reminds me that this is the time of year that we celebrate the birth of Christ. Then in a sense, I, I have, and the church has said, you've, you've, you've made this about Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the thing that I think is part of the genius of Catholicism is that over the centuries, it's been able to incorporate so many things and we redirect their purpose to to Christian ends. Mm-hmm. And that does not mean that just because there's a coincidence that other people bring trees into their house for other reasons, or other people have midwinter celebrations, means that our celebration is pagan. Right. I mean, in, in order to invalidate it, you would have to make some kind of argument either that we shouldn't, we just shouldn't do these kinds of human things, that they're somehow unchristian, which I don't think is supportable. Um, or you would have to argue that by doing these things, it somehow dilutes or perverts our, our worship of Christ. And I, I don't think you really have evidence for that either. I am not as worried. I'm not worried at all about um, celebrating the nativity and December 25 or having a Christmas tree. If I was going to be concerned about paganism sort of undermining Christmas, I'd be concerned about the commercialism Mm-hmm. that's attached to it today. I'd be concerned about Black Friday. I'd be concerned about a lot of other ways. I could be concerned about the horrible Chris holiday music. Mm-hmm. I'd be concerned about a lot of other things that have basically under, un, uh, undermined or watered down 
our celebration of, of Christmas. And those are happening, you know, because there's always the world is sort of battering against us and that we live in, you know, a secular world. And we sometimes have allowed a lot of secularism to undermine or dilute our mm -hmm. celebration of the nativity. So I would say, you chime in, I'll give you a last word here, but, but as the penultimate last word, I would say, you know, uh, celebrate Christmas as the feast of the nativity, be joyful. The churches and its wisdom over the centuries decided to fix that as the date at which we commemorate the nativity of Christ and bring in a Christmas tree. Let it remind you of the baby Jesus and worry not so much about those having pagan origins. Be more concerned about secularism undermining your celebration of Christmas. But I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I guess what I would say is that um, the, the basic response to someone who's trying to argue with you that a particular practice is sort of been baptized by the church or Christianized from paganism is to kind of say, well, so what? Like, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't make it a bad thing. And it doesn't prove that the holiday itself or what we're celebrating was sort of co-opted from paganism. It, it, it doesn't really, it, it, it's an argument without any real teeth. Oh, uh, yeah. And it doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, well, hey, thank you, Corey. And Merry Christmas. I'll hold off on saying that. But. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you for listening. My name is Greg Smith. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, would you please hit the like and subscribe buttons wherever you get your podcasts? And please share it with others. And if you're curious about the Catholic worldview and faith, the Church and its Saints, or Catholic history, culture, and art, then visit consideringcatholicism.com. And email me to let me know what you think. Greg at consideringcatholicism.com. Dot com.